lose our freedom if we don't value it. We have lost freedoms. We've acquired freedoms and then lost them again because most of our community didn't value them enough and chose convenience instead. For instance, there are many distributions of GNU slash Linux. Variants of the system. People started developing those in 1992 or so to make it easier to install and run the system. A few years later, there were several distributions competing in a community where most people didn't think about in terms of freedom. And so the developers of some distribution had the idea that to gain in the competition, they could add some non-free programs that did some jobs that there was no free software to do at the time and present them as advantages. And say, if you get our distribution, look what you get. You get this and this and this additional features. And of course, those were non-free programs. So what was the message they were presenting to people? non-free programs are good. The exact opposite of the idea of the free software movement. A non-free program attacks your freedom, escape. Well, most people in the community didn't think in these terms, so they gained more success. Then the developers of other distros looked at that and said, they're gaining. We have to put in non-free programs too so that we can eliminate their advantage. So over the next few years, they did that, and free distributions disappeared. So 15 years ago, when people asked me at the end of the speech, where can I get this system, I had to say, I'm sorry to say this, but although there are dozens of distributions, there is not one that I can recommend, because they all contain non-free software. Well, I guess it was between 15 and 10 years ago that this started to happen. Maybe it was only 13 years ago that this was the case. In other words, we had arrived at freedom and we had fallen back, because most of our community didn't appreciate freedom enough to hold on to it. So, I'm happy to say that today there are completely free GNU slash Linux distros. For instance, there is Ututo, and there is BLAG, which stands for BLAG, Linux, and GNU. And there is GNUsense, and Parabola, and Triskel and a few others, look in gnu.org slash distros for the full list. But as you can already recognize, these are not the widely used, well-known distros. Because those continue to contain and or recommend non-free programs. Which means we have just begun to recover the freedom that we lost by failing to value it. And then we lost our freedom in another way. Nowadays, the source code of Linux, the kernel, is not entirely free software. In fact, it's not entirely source code. In some supposed source files, you find a long list of numbers, which can be up to 300,000 numbers. And those lists are really executable programs disguised as source code. But representing an executable as a vector of numbers does not make real source code. The real source code of those programs is not available, which is why they're not free software. But in fact, many of them carry explicit non-free licenses too. Now how did this happen? Well, at one point Torvalds developed Linux as proprietary software in 91. Then in 92 he made it free, and then some years later, he started putting in non-free pieces. And for him, it was never an issue of principle. It was just a matter of what seemed sort of convenient or nice to do. So he didn't have to do any soul searching before he put in those non-free pieces. He didn't have a 
principle that he would be violating. And what this shows is when our freedom depends on somebody who doesn't value that freedom, it's precarious because he might get rid of it at any time through something that for him is just a practical decision. <clears throat> so, to make up for this problem, to, because we want to be able to recommend completely free GNU slash Linux systems, well, a completely free system can't have those non-free blobs. So, we maintain a modified version of Linux called Linux Libre. And what we do is, we just delete those blobs. And we have scripts to do it. So it's not a lot of work anymore. De developing the scripts took some work, but using them is easy. So every time Torvalds releases a new version, we run the scripts and we release a new version of Linux Libre. Uh, and this way, we have a kernel that's free. But there is an underlying real problem here. Of course, he didn't, he didn't put in those non-free pieces just as a whim. He had a practical motive. Uh, and that is, there are peripherals that you can't use in the free world. And the reason is, the manufacturers refuse to tell you how to run the thing. They'll sell you the product, but they refuse to tell you how to use it. Which is disgusting. But that's what they do. So, instead of telling you how to use the peripheral, they offer you a non-free program to use it with. So, we can't write free software to run those peripherals, because they we don't know how to run those peripherals. We don't know what the job is that needs to be done. To find that out, we need reverse engineering which is a big job. But it's very important. If you want to make a technical contribution to the free software community, and you want to contribute a lot, do reverse engineering. If you can figure out how to run one of these peripherals, then somebody else can write a free program to do it, and then we'll be able to use that peripheral in the free world. In fsf.org, you can find the high priority projects list, which includes high priority reverse engineering projects. So please think about working on that if you're technically minded. But in, as long as this, so solving this underlying problem has to be done either that way or by persuading the manufacturers to respect their customers. But as long as the underlying problem exists, there are two ways to respond to it. There's Torvalds' way, which is to disguise the problem, and there's our way, which is to recognize the problem, to say, yes, it's really a pain, but these peripherals can't be used in the free world today, and we are not going to recommend any non-free software, of course. Therefore, we can't offer you a system that runs those peripherals. Whereas Torvald says, I'll offer you a system that runs those peripherals. It won't be free software anymore, but he never cared that much about that. So as you can see, our future depends on our values. What decision we make when there is an underlying problem like this depends on our values. And that's why the most important thing to do is to teach people to value freedom more. And the way you can contribute most is by insisting on valuing freedom, especially when the people around you don't. When all the people around you start walking off to non-freedom, just stand there. Don't go with them. That's already starting to contribute. Meanwhile, nowadays, you can run non-free programs without even noticing it. Because uh, lots of web pages come with JavaScript programs, and usually they're not free. There are some of them that are free, but most of them are not. And they get installed into your browser, and they run, and it doesn't tell you. Uh, so to prevent this from happening, 
I have JavaScript deactivated all the time in my browser. I'm not going to run their non-free programs. But when I got into the airport last night, I saw a sign saying free Wi-Fi here. I tried connecting and it, in my browser it said, uh, please activate JavaScript to connect. Of course, I couldn't do that. Uh, instead, Tomo uh, uh, was nice enough to find a contact at Finavia for the group that runs the Wi-Fi group there, and I sent him mail last night asking them to please make it work without JavaScript. And in the meantime, I can't use it. Uh, I won't run a non-free program for that. So you might be able to help uh, push for this too. Uh, if they get a lot of messages from people, then maybe they'll fix this. Because there's no good reason. You know, there, there's, it won't be hard. They can easily make it work without JavaScript, and they won't lose anything. It'll just take them a little work and the decision to pay attention to the issue. But there's another way you can lose control of your computing without running any non-free program yourself. It's called software as a service, and here's what it means. The user wants to do some of her own computing, I meaning she's got some data and she wants to do computing on that data, which is by herself, it's for herself, nobody else is involved. She could do this by running the appropriate program in her own computer. But with software as a service, that means some network service invites her to send all the pertinent data to the network service which will then do her computing for her and send her back the result. Or else take action on her behalf based on the computing done on the data she provided. And this computing is done by programs that the user can't see or touch. And the user has no control over how it's done. So that means that Using software as a service is the is equivalent to you running a non-free program. They both produce the same bad effect. The user loses control over her computer. And therefore you have to reject software as a service just as you have to reject non-free software. But in fact, software as a service is even worse. As I've explained already, some non-free programs have spy features that transmit data about the use of the computer to some server. With software as a service, the user is told, send your data to the server. It's the same result. The, the user's data, the data about that user's use of the computing of the computer is in a server, and who knows who it's going to show that data to. Well, if it's a U.S. company, we know it's going to show that data to Big Brother. Because there's a law saying they all have to show any data about person, any, any personal data with a few very limited exceptions. They have to show to Big Brother without even the court order. So you should never trust any data to a U.S. company. But then, <clears throat> uh, as I explained, some proprietary programs have universal backdoors. For instance, Microsoft Windows, uh, nearly all portable phones, Google Chrome. Google Chrome is a non-free browser with a universal backdoor, uh, which allows someone to remotely change how the user's computing is done without asking that user's permission to do this. Well, with software as a service, the owner of the server can at any time install different or additional programs in that server and thus change how the user's computing gets done without asking the user for permission. Now, if it's his computer, he should have control over it. He should be able to change the software in it, but it has this, in this 
particular use case of software as a service, the consequence is to change how the user's computing gets done. And that means that using software as a service is equivalent to using a non-free program with spy features and a universal backdoor. You must say no to this. Fortunately, SaaS, as it's called, is rare. If we look at all the world's websites, most of them just present information. Looking at that information is not doing your own computing, so the issue doesn't arise. But if we look at the minority that have some sort of service, most of the time the service is communicating with other people. That's not your own computing, so the issue doesn't arise. But there are some where they offer to do computing that is just yours and ought to be fully under your control. Basically, if the service if the service replaces some hypothetical program that you could that could be written and released as free software, you could run it on your own computer, then the service is SaaS. Which is why it says software as a service. Communication as a service is a different issue. You know, communication with others is not something you do by yourself. You do it with others. It's a different kind of issue. But your own computing that's personally yours, you should be able to have control over. And any service that invites you to give up that control, you've got to say no to. Finally, free software and education. All educational activities, including all schools, must teach exclusively free software. All schools from kindergarten to the university. And this is not just a matter of saving money and doing education a little better. This is about doing good education instead of bad education. <clears throat> there are some proprietary developers that offer gratis copies to schools. Why do they do this? It's because they want to use those schools as instruments to improve.